Can everybody hear me out there? Yes, excellent. Okay, uh, I really wish I could be with you. I was really looking forward to it, and then my daughter got COVID, and then I got COVID. So, uh, in order to spare you from the the plague, uh, I'm going to speak to you from my computer, which I which I I hate doing. Um, but uh, glad you're all here. It's a privilege and an honor to be with you, Th Steve. Thank you for that generous introduction. So, here's what I'm going to do today. Um, Normally you have experts, they come to you, they say, hi, I'm an expert. Let me explain to you based on my experience uh, how we can predict the future um, and plan accordingly. Or let me explain to you based on my brilliant theory of the world, uh, how you can understand everything and we can plan accordingly. I'm going to do the opposite. OK, I'm going to argue to you today that we don't know anything. Uh, and that people who tell you that they can predict the future really don't know anything. And you should be very, very nervous when anybody tells you that we know anything whatsoever. Uh, I'm going to argue for, <laughs> I see some applause. Okay. I didn't know that. I didn't know that total idiocy was going to get applause here, but, but that's where we are folks. Right. Um, and I'm going to try to walk us through why, why we need to be a lot more humble. Americans, frankly, in particular, but this goes for all of us from whatever part of the world we're in. I'm going to argue that we should be humble, that we should be scared, uh, that we should see the need for humility and a certain degree of healthy fear as quite urgent, uh, and that that actually has implications for how we think about national security, how Americans think about national security strategy, and how all of us around the world should think about security. Um, and it has in particular implications for, for how we think about democracy. Um, so let me, let me try to jump in here. And I'm going to start by saying some things that you already know, that everybody already knows, but we often don't quite know it in the right way. And I'll, I'll try to explain what that means, what I mean by that. So, OK. Premise number one, uh, the world is a confusing and dangerous mess right now. And nobody has the slightest idea of what's going to happen next week, next month, next year, much less a decade from now. Um, and paradoxically, though it might paradoxical though it might seem, that mess and confusion actually, as I said, has some implications for how we think about strategy. So let me start by talking about the nature of that confusing mess that we're in right now. And here again, I'm going to say stuff that you already know, but suggest that maybe we should think about it in a slightly different way. So number one, uh, why is our world complicated, confusing, uncertain, et cetera? Number one, uh, the technological revolutions of the last century or so have made our world more globally interconnected than ever before. Number two, power and access to power has become both at the same time both more democratized and more diffuse uh, and also more concentrated in certain ways even as it's more democratized and diffuse in other ways number three for people around the globe day-to-day -day life is currently a whole lot less dangerous and brutal than in previous era eras for most people but the species as a whole faces a much higher risk of existential threat and global catastrophe than ever before. And number three, the continue, I'm sorry, the number four, the continuously accelerating rate of technological and social change makes it increasingly difficult to predict the geopolitical future. So as I said, there's nothing original about those observations. Right, they're repeated in some fashion or other in essentially every major national strategic document produced in the United States in the last couple of decades. They're repeated over and over in every UN document, every NATO document, every OSCE document, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, in the documents of US adversaries, those premises are repeated over and over. We all know that. There's nothing original about what I just said. You've heard it a million times. Uh, they probably teach this stuff to kindergarten students now at this point. Um, so why am I saying it? Well, I'm saying it because we have all heard it so often that it's tempting to think we know what it means, right? It's tempting to dismiss it as, yeah, 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 so many meaningless platitudes, um, sure, sure, interconnectedness, complexity, rapid, rapid rate of change, existential risk, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, 
And we can't let these things be reduced to platitudes. I think we need to figure out what does it mean to really feel it in our bones as opposed to just blithely toss these statements off or talk about them at cocktail parties or dutifully write this stuff down in, in strategic documents. Um, so I want to try to actually breathe a little bit of life into what can often sound like cliches and, and hopefully leave you feeling kind of scared. Um, so, all right, start by considering both the nature of the changes that have occurred in the last century or so and the rate of change. Go back a century, roughly a century, a little over a century, 1914, um, 1920, the world population was about 1.9 billion people um, just over 100 years ago, less than 2 billion people. And there were only about 60 sovereign states in the world. Just over 100 years ago, the automobile was still a rarity. There were no commercial passenger flights. There was no transcontinental telephone service just over a century ago. Even 50 years ago, 50 years ago, global population had gotten up to 3 billion. There were about 115 member states of the United Nations. But even 50 years ago, air travel was still for the wealthy. The personal computer lay a decade or more in the future. Contrast that, and that was not that long ago, right? That was that was our grandparents. In some cases, for those of you older folks sitting in the audience, it may have been your parents' childhood. It was not that long ago. I'm not looking at anybody in particular. I can't see you well enough, I promise. Uh, but I think of my own grandfather, right? I remember my own grandfather who was born in 1903 telling me that he remembers, he grew up in Philadelphia, he remembers sitting on the on the metro on the subway in Philadelphia as a boy uh, and looking across at the, the the folded newspaper of the man sitting across the aisle from him uh, and reading the headline about the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand on that man's newspaper uh, and that was that was you know one degree of connection removed from me that was somebody I knew that was 1914 uh, that was his reality in those days when most people didn't have cars nobody had televisions a lot of people didn't even have radios, nobody had mobile phones, et cetera, et cetera, not long ago. So contrast that with today. Today, we have 7.9 billion people in the world, right? Compare that again to, to uh, less than 2 billion 100 years ago. And the 7.9 billion people who live in the world today take about 100,000 commercial air flights every single day from more than 15,000 airports. Those people drive at least 1.4 billion cars. They carry more than 7 billion mobile phones, more than half of which are smartphones that people can use to do everything as we know from monitoring your heart rate to buying stocks, to posting restaurant reviews, to sharing family photos, tweeting real time about unfolding events, creating, distributing videos for aspiring terrorists, you name it, right? We can do all of those things. Just a hundred years ago, human beings living inside the borders of any one state really couldn't have much direct or immediate impact on people living in other states. And today is again, as you know, you know all this, right? That's not true anymore. A collapse in the stock market in one state can trigger rapid meltdowns around the globe. A destructive computer virus or a biological virus, as we've seen, uh, can spread around the globe in hours, days, weeks. Carbon emissions in the United States or in China can change sea levels in the Netherlands or cause increasingly severe and unpredictable weather around the globe. And I want to be clear that not all of these changes are bad things. I don't mean to suggest that they're all have just had bad impacts by any means. In all kinds of ways, as I said, life has actually gotten substantially better uh, for numerous individuals in this more crowded, more interconnected era. You know, 75 years ago, right, World War II, global war killed scores of millions. Uh, but today, notwithstanding the war in Syria, the war in Ukraine, the wars in Iraq, et cetera, notwithstanding those wars, interstate conflict has declined. It declined sharply after World War II, uh, despite the resurgence of great power conflict, the risk of great power conflict, despite the recent conflicts, 
it's still a lot lower than it has been at many earlier points. Um, similarly, especially in the half century or so immediately following World War II, medical and agricultural advances brought unprecedented health and prosperity to most parts of the globe. And the communications revolution, those, those 7 billion smartphones, uh, have enabled exciting forms of non-governmental cross-border alliances to emerge. They've empowered global human rights and environmental movements. Uh, they've also had a powerful leveling effect such that today all over the globe, people at every age and income level can use these little tiny, you know, powerful computers that we all have to, to learn a foreign language, to solve complex mathematical problems, to create and share videos, to watch the news, to move money, to communicate with far-flung friends. This, as you know, obviously also has a dark side. Uh, as that access to knowledge has been democratized, so too has access to the tools of violence and destruction. Um, that same greater interconnectedness also enables disease, population, conflict to spread unimaginably quickly beyond borders. As I said, 100 years ago, essentially no single individual or non-state actor could do much more than cause localized harm. But today we have to worry about massive bioengineered threats created by tiny terror cells, globally devastating cyber attacks devised by you know, individual malevolent hackers and so on. And we've also seen as a, another paradox, even as many forms of power have gotten more democratized and diffuse, a lot of other forms of power have gotten more centralized. Today, a very small number of states control and consume a very disproportionate share of the world's resources. Uh, I'm talking to us Americans. Um, and a very tiny number of individuals control most of the world's wealth. Um, in 2014, the richest 85 people on Earth were worth more than the globe's three and a half billion poorest people. And today, the richest 10% of adults in the world own 85% of global household wealth. Finally, from a species perspective, even though things have gotten better for a lot of individuals around the world, uh, the world has grown a lot more dangerous from a species perspective. You know, individuals live longer than ever before, but we have a small number of states that possess the unprecedented ability to destroy large chunks of the human race and possibly the Earth itself, all in a matter of days or even hours. Nuclear material and know-how is both less controlled and less controllable. And with the conflict in Ukraine, we have seen what just a few years ago would have seemed like an unimaginable return to the era in which we have to take seriously the idea of a nuclear conflict. Uh, we've seen a superpower threatening the potential use of nuclear weapons. Climate change is creating existential risks and human activity, both related to climate change, to overpopulation, to the development of wild lands, has greatly increased the risk that diseases will jump from animals to humans, that there will be more pandemics like the one we are, we are still emerging from, and that there may be ones that are worse. So why am I saying all of this stuff that you know, right? Um, I think that amidst all these changes, we, we, we really tend to underemphasize and underappreciate the degree to which they have made our world much more uncertain. Another paradox, right? We have far more information than any generations of human beings at any time in the history of the Earth. Um, we have far greater processing power than any humans at any time in the history of the Earth. But the accelerating pace of global change has greatly exceeded our collective ability to understand it, much less manage it. And that makes it increasingly difficult to make predictions about the future or to calculate risks. Um, we literally have no point of comparison for understanding the scale and the scope of the risks faced by humanity today. You think about, think about if you were a European peasant in the year 1900, your life probably had a lot more in common day to day with the life of a European peasant in 1800 or 1700 or even 1300 than it did with the average European today, right? Um, and, and think about that, right? Think about the fact that for, for millennia of human history, ordinary life was pretty much the same for 95% of people on earth 
Uh, you know, the pace was slow. It was agricultural. You probably didn't leave. You probably never went more than about 10 or 15 miles from the place you were born in your whole life. Um, you didn't know much about people anywhere else. And then starting in the mid 19th century in particular, the pace of change started going. And that's what it's been like in the last century, right? We're, we're, we're at that point where suddenly things just transformed in the equivalent of a blink of an eye. And so compared to the long, slow sweep of human history, the events of the last century or so have taken place just in the blink of an eye, relatively speaking. And this should give us pause when we are tempted to conclude that any of the trends we think about and talk about today are likely to continue. Um, it's also why we shouldn't dismiss the risk of catastrophic events such as disastrous climate change or nuclear conflict as events. We like to talk about these things as, you know, high consequence, low probability events like nuclear conflict. I'm not actually sure it makes any, it means anything to say that such risks are low probability because we don't know anything about their probability. You know, how do you compute the probability of catastrophic events of a type that have never before occurred in human history during a period of human history that is in all kinds of ways, both quantitatively and qualitatively, vastly different from any other period of history. I think about, the, I'm always hearing people say things like when it comes to the risk of nuclear conflict, like, well, you know, we've had 70 years with nuclear weapons, more than 70 years, and there hasn't been any nuclear annihilation yet. There hasn't been a nuclear conflict yet. If you conclude from that that there's a low probability of a nuclear conflict, that seems a little bit weird, right? As opposed to saying, well, in 75 years or so, that just means that we haven't had a nuclear conflict yet. It's not a lot of data points to go on. Um, and think of it like an earthquake, actually, right? Lack of catastrophic change might signify that we're in a system that's in a stable equilibrium. Um, or it might mean that pressure is building up undetected, we can't see it, and things could collapse very quickly. Take, take a couple of geopolitical examples. Um, uh, when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, it took most analysts by surprise. Most analysts assumed that the Soviet Union was stable until it wasn't stable anymore. More recently, same country, most experts assumed that Russia was not going to evade Ukraine, invade Ukraine until Putin did. Right. A lot of our assumptions, I, I wonder how much of the things in the world today that we currently file under the heading stable should probably be recategorized under the heading, you know, hasn't collapsed yet, hasn't happened yet. And this is where we are. And again, I'm, I'm, I emphasize all of this because we say all these things, oh, rapid pace of change, complexity, interconnectedness, diffusion of power, da 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 da. da. Um, globalization, we say all these things all the time, but I think usually we don't feel it. We say it and then we blithely go right ahead and say things like, and now business as usual, you know, uh, existential risk, unprecedented rate of change, total inability to process this amount of information uh, and to address these unprecedented situations. Um, and now let's go on and make predictions. Now let's go on and, and say things like, well, because this is the way it is today, this is probably going to be the way it is tomorrow or in a year or in 10 years or in 20, 20 years. But we don't have a playbook right now. You know, we don't, we don't have experience to fall back on. Our experience is the blink of an eye. You know, anyone who says, hi, you know, I'm, I'm 75 years old. I've been a diplomat. I've been a political scientist. I've been an expert. I've been a military leader my whole life and I know X and Y. We don't know anything. We don't know anything because the last century has been so unprecedented and so unusual because we simultaneously have much too much information that we don't know how to process and not nearly enough information because the period of time that we are looking at is actually quite, quite small relative to human history. Okay, so <laughs> What do we do with all of this? I've, I've now said we don't know anything, we can't predict anything, and the world is actually full of existential dangers that we we don't even know how to assess. We don't even know how to think about them. Um, we have no idea how to determine whether the fact that X or Y hasn't happened is because a situation is stable or because we've been lucky. Um, 
Let me add one additional thing to this uh, that is specific to the United States, although it's got some implications for other countries as well. Um, we also know that U.S. power is declining. It's declining both in relative terms, declining in relative terms in, because other states have risen in their power and global influence, and it's also declining in absolute terms. You know, by almost every measure, whether you want to think about it economically or politically, the U.S. has got serious, serious problems. Uh, there's greater inequality in the United States economically at this point than there has been at any point before in our rather short history. Uh, we are struggling with declining schools, crumbling infrastructure. We have one of the, you know, uh, uh, life expectancy has been going down. Rates of things like infant mortality, maternal mortality have been going up. They do not compare well to other countries. Um, so we've got all kinds of social and economic problems domestically in the United States. And we also have experienced uh, uh, unprecedented amount of political chaos, unprecedented amount of gridlock, of paralysis, of partisan division. Um, I think we reached the the apotheosis, apotheosis of this so far was January 6, 2021, when we saw a mob storming the U.S. Capitol and coming perilously close to taking it over, right? And we've now we kind of go, oh, well, that's over. Now things are okay again. But as has been my theme so far, I wouldn't assume that anything is okay again in a, in a more permanent way, as opposed to temporarily beaten back, right? Um, and we're at a moment when distrust in democracy in the United States is at a very, very high level. Um, indeed, trust in democracy, faith in democracy has declined around the globe uh, in recent years. Uh, I'll give you a couple of statistics from a 2020 Pew Research report that looked at 34 countries from Canada and Italy to Russia, Indonesia, Brazil, Lebanon, Nigeria. They found that about 57% 57% of people polled globally were dissatisfied with democracy. Only about 44% said they were satisfied. 69% of British people, 59% of Americans, 58% of French people said they were dissatisfied with democracy. Uh, and around the world, as we know, authoritarian leaders have taken advantage of these popular doubts. Um, that skepticism is not entirely unfounded. Um, uh, there are all kinds of ways in which it is true that democracies and liberal democracies have failed to deliver. Um, so that's another piece of the situation we're in right now. So what does all this mean for strategy? What does all this depressing stuff, all this radical uncertainty mean for strategy? The fact that the US is in decline economically, politically, that there's declining faith in democracy, that we basically don't know what is going on in the world and are very, very poor at making predictions because we don't have enough information and at the same time we have too much of it. To me, that is a really compelling argument for what we might call strategic humility. Um, and it is a really compelling argument for building an approach to national security that is premised on a kind of radical uncertainty that is premised in a deep way, not in a not in a shallow and superficial way on that recognition that we really don't know much and that the world is very, very dangerous. Right. If we have the false sense of being able to predict the future. We're going to make mistakes and we're going to make mistakes anyway, actually, right? No matter what we think, we're going to make mistakes because that's that's pretty much what it is to be human. But I think that the implications of really acknowledging how little we know, how little we can predict and how dangerous the world is, is it pushes us towards a national security strategy and a global security strategy that is premised on on hedging against the most catastrophic downside risks. Um, I don't have too much time, so I, I don't want to. I don't want to get too abstract, and maybe, but I will. Uh, anybody in your, this audience uh, ever read the philosopher John Rawls? Everybody's. I, I can see the eyes. A couple people. Are, Steve's got his hand up. I think a couple people are kind of looking. Man, eh, maybe most people are looking totally blank. Um, he's an American philosopher, and he he did this kind of very famous thought experiment in one of his books. Um, uh, he 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 said. Imagine that human beings uh, had to try to decide what kind of world they wanted to live in 
in this kind of abstract state, he calls it behind the veil of ignorance. Let's say you could sort of take these abstract human brains uh, and they know a lot about history and so on, but they don't know they don't know where they will be born. They don't know if they're going to be born rich or poor, male or female, tall or short, healthy or unhealthy, intelligent or not as intelligent, et cetera, et cetera. If you were a rational actor and you looked around you at the world and you said, I'm going to have to be in that world, but I don't know what my position in that world is going to be. You know, I don't know if I'll be rich or poor, or black or white. Uh, I don't know if I'll live in South America or, or wherever, you know. Um, what kind of world would I want to be born into? What set of rules, what set of social rules, what kind of political rules and organization would I want that would maximize the likelihood that I'm going to be okay, whether I'm born rich or poor, whether I'm born American or Chinese or Nigerian, you know, whether I'm born male or female, et cetera. Um, and he says, work from that. You know, if you start from that position of radical uncertainty, um, what kind of universe would you want to be born into if you can't predict your level of power, your level of wealth, uh, or anything else that you have? And I think it's worth, and maybe this is something that you all can discuss in your in your smaller seminar groups, trying to do an, an international version of that experiment or a national security version of that experiment, if you will. The US's power is declining, both absolutely and relatively. As we think about the future, as we think about the U.S.'s approach to national security strategy, uh, and I, I say this for the Americans in the audience, I know many of you are from other countries, so you can do a version of this thinking about your own, your own national security strategy. As we think, we don't know whether in 10 years or 100 years, the U.S. is going to be powerful or weak. You know, we don't know whether there will have been some catastrophic impacts of climate change or not. You know, maybe we'll figure something out. Uh, we don't know which states will have nuclear weapons and which won't. We don't know whether some state will have used them. If we look ahead at the future and we think, here are these things that we don't know and that we can't know, and that anybody who tells you that they know is lying, right? It's exaggerating their, their powers of prediction. If we take that radical uncertainty and say, how should we try to shape the world now when we do have some power to maximize the likelihood that in some future in which we don't know where where we're going to be, what the world will be like, what level of power the US or any other country will have, what how can we shape the world now to increase the likelihood that we won't be up shit creek in 100 years? And if you will, that was kind of a fancy way of saying it by referring to a philosopher and so on, right? Um, you can look up John Rawls and the original position in Veil of Ignorance if you want to you want to flirt with philosophy, or you can just think of it in a much more simple and straightforward way. How many of you own? Uh, how many of you have homeowners insurance or renters insurance or life insurance or health insurance in this room? You know, everybody, right? How many of you think it's likely that your house is going to burn down tomorrow or the next day? I'm, it's good that there's nobody's got their hand up. If anybody had their hand up there, I'd be kind of worried about your houses, right? Um, we assume that that probably won't happen, but we know that we don't know. You know, when it comes to buying homeowners insurance or life insurance, we know that we don't know. You know, we hope things will be fine. We hope we'll live for a long time. We hope our houses won't burn down. Um, we have to go through the world kind of acting as though our house will be there tomorrow and will be there tomorrow. But at the same time, we do buy insurance. We buy insurance because we don't know. And we want to protect ourselves against the downside risk because we also know that we can't predict. You know, an actuary can predict in the aggregate how many of us are going to be dead in a year. But on an individual level, it's very rare that we can do that. I mean, unless you know, some unusual situations in which we could, but mostly we don't know. And on the geopolitical level, this is my argument to you. We also ha we have no idea. We don't know the level of power the US will have, the level of power China will have, Nigeria, et cetera. We don't know how much geopolitical conflict there will be. We don't know how wealth will be distributed. We don't know anything about much of anything looking ahead more than a day or two, right? We really don't. And what does that mean for how we think about how we should shape the world. What does it mean to have insurance policies? What does it mean to try to shape the world in such a way 
that if we turn out to be amongst the less well off individually or nationally speaking, that we still will be as well off as we possibly can be given inequalities and so forth. And I, I can talk about specifically what that means. And this is something I've written about in the past and gotten into a more nitty gritty level of detail about what that implies for global governance, what that implies for uh, thinking about access to global goods and so on. I'm happy to talk about that in, in the questions and answers, but just in the interest of time, I'm mostly going to say I'm going to let you all think about that in your smaller group discussions. Um, the only other thing that I'm going to add right now um, uh, about what the implications of that, what does it mean to sort of take insurance out on a, a national or a geopolitical level um, is to talk again about democracy. Democracy, as I said, um, is not uh, it's not having a shining moment uh, nationally or globally. There's there's a lot of cynicism about democracy and there are a lot of attacks on democracy, both nationally and globally. I would argue that part of that hedging strategy, both domestically and globally, has to be premised on a renewed commitment to democracy, both in the US and around the world not out of some kind of tri triumphalist neoconservative you know rah rah ain't democracy great isn't america great at all but on the contrary um a commitment both nationally and globally to democracy should be premised on the idea that uh democracy is a protection against human fallibility and it's a protection against mistakes you know we should value democracy not despite the many failures and false starts and hypocrisies and hesitations made by democracies and the US in particular, but we should value democracy because of those failures, those hesitations and hypocrisies and false starts. Uh, we should embrace democracy and we should promote it not because it's perfect or we're perfect, but because we are completely imperfect and democracy, if you do it right, is and remains the only political system that has yet been devised that builds in a capacity for self-correction, right? Um, democracy is premised on a, a simple but still quite radical idea, which is that every human being counts, that we all have a right to participate in the decisions that will affect us, that no individual or group has a permanent monopoly on political wisdom. Um, Democracy can't thrive without certain degree of you know, free expression, rule of law, and so on and so forth, because if everybody counts, then everybody needs to be able to speak, needs to be able to argue, needs to be able to assemble with others. Everybody needs to have a shot at persuading other people, um, because we think that worthy ideas can come from some everybody and anybody, and that really bad ideas can come from anybody and everybody. Um, in democracies, there will absolutely be times when pernicious, really bad ideas will dominate our politics and our policies. We will get things wrong over and over and over again. But that's why we need that's why we need it, because democracy, um, we have to build in a capacity for change. We have to build in a capacity for a course correction a capacity for new ideas to gain traction, for old ones to be put aside. That's the only way we get through those periods where we get it wrong. And so think of democracy as a kind of a human fail safe. In a world that is so full of uncertainty, where we know so little, the part of a crucial part of hedging, both again, domestically and globally, has to be to try to build in that capacity for self-protection. Um, democracy lets us do stupid things, but it also lets us correct the stupid things we do. Um, I'm going to wrap up here, um, and I realize I haven't talked that much about specific geopolitical strategic approaches that we could take. I haven't talked that much about current events today, um, but I want to I want to suggest that framework to you, that framework in which we say, let's really let's try to take all of the language and all the things that we've all seen and, and read and said and written a hundred times about complexity, about interconnectedness, about the rate of change, et cetera. Um, let's try to take those things, let's try to really believe them 
and and not just slip right back into oh yeah 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 we we know what that means we know we know the implications of that and now we can carry on life as usual let's try to think about what it means to really believe them and the ways and the implications of that for how we think about strategy going forward how we think about the need to hedge against uncertainty and a, a truly radical uncertainty, one that is not premised on false assumptions, such as the US is powerful, the US will stay powerful, you know, or this is the distribution of power in the world, or um, well, you know, nuclear conflict hasn't happened yet, so it's not gonna happen, or climate change hasn't destroyed the world, so it probably won't, or the COVID pandemic was disruptive, but it didn't destroy the world, so pandemics won't. Let's try to think about what it means to think about both national strategy and, and global security strategy premised on the idea that we really don't know. We don't know, we don't have mechanisms for knowing, so how do we then hedge? You know, what does it mean to buy homeowners insurance, to buy life insurance for the United States? What does it mean for China? What does it mean for Nigeria? What does it mean for France? What does it mean for Brazil to buy insurance against the possible downside risks? Um, I've suggested that democracy, investing in democracy is part of buying insurance to have that capacity to continue to be nimble, to continue to self-correct. And that investment in democracy has to be premised on an acknowledgement that it means that sometimes bad ideas will prevail. You know, sometimes the other guy wins, sometimes the other party wins, uh, sometimes bad policies will be put out by democracies, but we still need it. We need to invest in the systems and the procedures because it's the only way to get rid of those bad ideas too, is gonna have to be through democracy, the only way to keep self-correcting. Um, I think I'm going to stop there. As I said, I, I, I realize I haven't left you with a lot of specific suggestions for how to move forward. Uh, I actually am happy to talk about what some of the contours of what I think it would mean to invest in a in a strategy built on uncertainty and and what kinds of things that the U.S. in particular should should be focusing on. Um, but uh, I've gone on for 30 minutes and it's time for me to stop and I look forward to your questions and comments.